For century after century, in the beginning after Jesus, there was church. And if you wanted to go to church, that was, there was one option. It's kind of like if you ever wanted a Model T, you could have any color Model T as long as you got it in. Right. If you wanted to go to church, you could go any, any church you wanted to as long as it was the church that was in your town, because that was it. No other options. Church, church, church. That's it. This continued until the third century, at, point, at which point about 10% of the population was Christian. And as far as I can tell, this was the point in the third century when there were started to be other churches. This is the, the, the beginning of, of churches splitting. And what happens, well, the beginning of, of churches splitting, it begins with two events. Uh, under Emperor Decius and Emperor Diocletian, subsequent emperors in, in the Roman Empire, they uh, persecuted the church. Up till then, there had been sporadic persecutions. A local Roman governor would kind of get sideways with local Christians, and, and he would uh, take some land, maybe knock the church down, imprison some people. But it was very random, and it was capricious, and it was hard. You couldn't predict it, which made it, it had its own sort of terror to it. You never knew when something might happen. But it was not a, a systemic across the empire thing. Decius and Diocletian, these are the two of the people who changed that. They decided to take an empire-wide approach, and they did this as part of a, a getting back to the good old days. They wanted to, to get back to the good old days of the earlier days of the Roman Empire. They wanted to get back to when everyone was trustworthy and people volunteered to serve in the military and you can take a man at his word and back when public, public officials were trusted and part of the, 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 the thing that marked those earlier days back before the public morality started to fall apart. What can you do to get back to the good old days well, let's go back to the old-time religion. And the old-time religion, from the point of view of Decius and Diocletian, is, the, is worshiping the Roman emperors. Oh, look, that's them. We're worshiping the Roman emperors as gods. So, across the entire empire, as part of this back to our roots, back to the good old days, back to the old-time religion, they required that everyone show up in front of a Roman magistrate, what we would think of as like a public notary today, and, and do an act of worship, burn a pinch of incense, and say, Caesar is Lord. That was required of everyone. And if you weren't going to do it, if you were ornery about it, they killed you. If you weren't ornery about it, they threw you in jail until you would do it. And then they took all your land. So this became quite a big deal. And, and so in some places, in Carthage, there were so many people showing up to worship Caesar, to b b burn the pinch of incense as a way to, to proclaim, I'm not a Christian, that we had the records of the local magistrate who, who, who had to tell the crowd, I can only deal with this many of you today. The rest of you come back and forsake your God tomorrow. Because uh, you just couldn't write fast enough to keep up with the demand for people wanting to worship Caesar. Uh, and so that's going on. Uh, the church, a lot of churches are being knocked down. Jailers were starting to uh, forge the, the, the document saying that someone had worshipped uh, Caesar because the jails were getting so full with Christians who had not, uh, who had, weren't willing to forsake uh, Jesus that the, the jailers didn't know what to do. Their, their prisons were full. They had, were starting to stack people. I don't know where to put these folks. Yeah, let's call, yeah, he worshipped Caesar. Get him out of here. So there, there's this real, it's a real like community-wide, uh, empire-wide problem or situation that's unfolding here. And what made it particularly problematic is the way in which they targeted the leaders in the church, the clergy. And the way that if you were a leader in the church, how could you prove that you weren't going to follow Jesus anymore? Well, here's what they did. Give us your Bible. Give us your Bible and we'll believe you. This is not in a time when they had pew Bibles. This is in a time when every single letter had to be written by hand, hand bound on handmade paper. So if a church had a Bible, they were doing good. I'm sure that not many of them had more than one. And so for your local pastor to give over the Bible, the a Bible that you have, that, that is a really big deal. 
After a few years, Decius can keep it up for three years. Diocletian down the road, he keeps this up for about seven or eight years. After the, the persecutions end, uh, the Edict of Milan is issued shortly thereafter, and that says that there'll be religious toleration, and the, and the Roman Empire gives up on everyone worshiping the same God, and, and it becomes everything kind of ratchets down, and that's the end of, of Christian persecution for, by the Roman Empire. And you think at that point everyone would say, whew, glad we got through that, let's get back to getting along, right? Well, there's a problem. There's always a problem. Here's the problem that uh, starts splitting churches. The problem is, what do you do with the people who burn the pinch of incense? Right? If you weren't willing to go and sit in jail, if you didn't go into hiding for your life, if you're one of the people who burn the pinch of incense to try to save your life or save your land, can you come back into the church? Some of the people in the church were saying, yeah, Jesus forgives, let him back on in, repent. I mean, show that you have repented and you've turned away from that sin, but come on, come on back home. And there were others in the church who, who called those who, was, who had lapsed, they, they didn't call them lapsed, they called them traditores, traitors. Right? If, you had not, uh, if you had not remained faithful, you were a traitor. And if the traitor, no, you're not going to come back to the church. The church is a gathering of the saints, and the saints are pure, and you are not. So the church is split over this. Churches start splitting all across the empire into the churches that say, yes, if you lapsed, if you burned the pinch of incense, you can, come, you can come on back and let's keep on keeping on. And, and then the other churches were those who uh, said, no, when, once you've taken a walk, you're gone. And the, and the bishop who led the churches that said, if you take a walk, you're out of here, he was named uh, Bishop Donus Magnus which is just a great Latin name. Uh, but in honor of Donus Magnus, uh, they're now called, this group is called the Donatists. They're the ones who said, uh, you have to uh, toe the line, and if you walked away, you're gone. And what happens is, as the Donatists and the rest of the church, every time they get together to try to work this out, the Donatist won't budge, because they're right. You ever meet someone who's just right, right? No matter what they say, they are right. And as soon as the rest, anyone in the rest of the church disagreed with the Donatists, right, they're the ones who are right. And the fact that you don't agree with me is proof that you don't get it. Because the fact that you would agree with me if you understood. The church is for the pure. And if you were pure, you would agree with me. And so you obviously aren't pure because I am right. <sighs> Right? It wasn't very productive discussions. And, and what happens as anyone, when a group goes down that road, like the, the Donatists, they're focused on the church as being pure. And so the, what happens after this is, is that the Donatists start splitting because if the Donatists, they said that we're the pure ones, a group of them step off and say, well, we're purer than you are. We must be the one true church. And then a group splits off them and says, well, we're purer than you are. And, and the whole, this, the churches just start splintering, these Donatist churches, because they're arguing about how I'm purer than you are. It just splinters until they splinter into nothingness. And they fade by, by about the seventh century. So here is the question that the church has to consider in the middle of all of this argument about whether we need to forgive people or be pure. Uh, the, peop the priests, the clergy, the leaders of the church, if you had been baptized by someone who had given up their Bible, were you really baptized? That, that was the question. If you were baptized by someone... Who had, who had turned traitor, traditor, had, had forsaken Jesus, were you really baptized? The purists, the Donatists, said no. If the pastor had turned traitor and turned in his Bible, his or her Bible, every time that pastor had attempted to baptize someone, they may have gotten wet, but they didn't get saved. And every time someone came forward to communion, you might have had a light snack, but you didn't have Jesus. That's what they were saying. And, and it leads... If you're in a Donatist church, and this is your argument that you have to be baptized by a pure pastor, can you imagine mothers going to pastors and saying, I'd like to have my infant baptized. Okay, what about next Sunday? Well, wait a minute, are you pure enough? Do I have to worry about the salvation of my son's soul because you're, can you pu prove that you're pure enough? Um, uh, yeah, it's just kind of been an awkward discussion. So that, that's the question that comes up. If you are baptized by a pastor who had failed, 
were you really baptized? So, what makes a sacrament happen? A sacrament where Jesus is showing up in a powerful way when we gather in the name of Jesus and someone who is set aside to lead worship does so in the baptism and communion. Is it, does it happen because of the purity of the person or does it happen because of the nature of the act itself? And, and I, 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 let me ask you this. Our sacraments is baptism. Is it more like if I come out and I hand one of you $25,000, if I hand you $25,000, is it a bribe or is it a gift? What determines when I give you $25,000 whether it's a bribe or a gift? What determines that? Me, right? It, it's determined by my character. Because if I give you $25,000 and, and, and then it's just, right, you just take it, that's a gift. But if I ask you something down the road, then it was a bribe. So in that situation, what just happened was determined by the purity of the person who did the deed. Let's, let's consider another situation. Let's say you go into our wonderful local hospital tomorrow and you have to get an IV. And let's say the nurse is mean. Now, I'm sure there are some mean nurses out there. There's not even mean nurses out there, but let's say someone comes through and subbing or something like that. And let's say you get a mean nurse and they get and they bruise you the heck, and they get, but they get the needle into the vein. You have an IV. Does the meanness of the nurse have anything to do with the effectiveness of the IV? Nope. Right? If the, vein, if the needle is in the vein, you have an IV. It might have hurt more, or it might have hurt less, but you have an IV. Right? In that situation, it's the action that matters, not the person who does the action. Which one are the sacraments like? Are the sacraments, are they more like the giving of money and, and it's determined by the person who, who, who offers it? Or is it more like the nurse? It doesn't really matter whether, whether the nurse is mean or gentle. If the needle hits the vein, you're good. Is it the act itself that matters? St. Augustine looks at this. He, he's in living in this timeline, time frame, and he argues with the Donatist. He argues that it is not about the purity of the priests. The purity of the priest doesn't matter because what does Jesus say? This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's Jesus' words that matter. The person who says them, well, whatever. It's Jesus that matters. Jesus is the one who, who makes the difference. And if some of the priests are bums, as happens, Jesus says, if you have the wheat and the tares, the wheat and the weeds, you can't go in and start weeding because you're going to tear up the others. You, can't, you have to accept the fact that we are a mixed group. Jesus never kicked Judas out of the disciples. He continued to be a disciple. Right? If you go looking for leaders in the Bible who are perfect, can anyone think of a perfect leader in the Bible? Abraham, how many times did he tell other people that his wife was his sister? Twice. Okay. Then his son does it. David, great king. Bathsheba. What's the first time you read about Paul in the Bible? What's Paul doing? He's watching Stephen be stoned as the first Christian martyr. Every leader in the church is first a sinner. Everyone. And as with everyone, saved by grace. Ephesians reminds, of, reminds us of this. For by grace you have been saved, not of yourselves, it's a gift from God. And having established that, then he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Jesus Christ for good works. So first we are saved by as a gift and then we are created for good works. The good works are secondary. For some of us, those good works are to teach and to lead and to speak. And God help those of us who are going to get up and speak and teach and lead because James reminds us, not everyone should be teachers, for you are going to use your tongue. And with the same tongue you curse and you bless. Whoever can keep their tongue in check is doing an impressive thing. So we expect our leaders to have tamed their tongues, to speak not only wisely but gracefully. We expect our leaders not only to be forgiven, but to be people who then forgive others. Right? Heresy is taking one aspect of the faith and pushing it too far. And so it is a good thing to expect our leaders not just to talk to talk, but to walk the walk. Right? It's a good thing to say that our leaders should be forgiven and then forgive others. That our leaders should say that let's go serve our neighbors and then go serve. Our leaders should 
teach about the importance of study and service and prayer and tithing and confession and then do the same. But that does not mean that our leaders, we should expect them to be perfect. Right? It's not going to happen. And when a leader is not perfect, that doesn't mean Jesus isn't Lord. That means that it doesn't mean that anyone who's been baptized by that person wasn't baptized. If you are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's that. You are baptized. It doesn't matter if you were baptized by a bum, you were still baptized because Jesus is the one who baptizes, not me. When it, whether the nurse is gentle or mean, as soon as the needle hits your, your vein, you have an IV. Whether a pastor is a saint or a jerk, when they, serve you a when they serve you communion, you have received the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And whether that pastor turns out to be even more of a bum later in life, that's on them. It was only, when you come forward, that's a decision, that's an agreement between you and Jesus. I happen to be the one up front. But I'm not the one that counts. It's you and Jesus. I happen to hold the water. Now, it is better to have gentle nurses and it's better to have saintly pastors because if you have a, a mean nurse, you might have bruises. And you have a pastor who is not, not up to snuff, there are bruises of the sort there as well. To quote Ecclesiastes, there is nothing new under the sun and we still struggle with putting our leaders on pedestals just as they then did back then. We expect our leaders to have all the answers to never sin and to always know what is next. And it is hard for me to, to, uh, to address this particular heresy because of all of the heresies we've addressed about the Bible, of the church, of Jesus. This is one about leadership, and I, I am one. Right? I am, God help you, a leader. I constantly strive to do the good works that I, as well as each of us, were made to do, being fully aware that I am saved by grace as much as any. The most powerful moment of worship for me, week after week after week, is the moment in which after I have said, in the name of Christ you are forgiven, you all look at me and say, in the name of Christ you are forgiven. And I think, Whew. I have had leaders in the church fail me. I am sure that that is the case for you as well. I mean, if you think about it, when has someone who's a leader in the church failed you? It's happened. I'm sure it has. It leaves a bruise, sometimes worse. And if I haven't failed you as of yet, good, but don't hold your breath. <laughs> I am glad I have, give it a while, it may happen. What makes the sacraments powerful, what makes the church the vessel of salvation, what makes this go is not that the leader is perfect, it's that Jesus is, the Lord who beckons us to them. What changes the lives of each of our lives again and again is the Holy Spirit moves on us. What transforms the world is the Father whose kingdoms we are heading towards. Thanks be to God, our salvation does not depend upon the perfection of our leaders, because if that was the case, y'all would be doomed. But it doesn't depend on me or any other leader. Our salvation depends upon Jesus, the one who is perfect. Thank God.